to a time of worship and celebration. We're so glad you're with us. Why don't you stand to your feet? Get ready to lift your voices with us now. Welcome to Hope. We're so glad that you chose to join us today. And a quick shout out to all of our Hope at Home groups meeting in the Fuquay Verena and surrounding areas. 
And even though we don't have a campus right now in Fuquay, we are so excited that the fact our people are coming together, we're building community, and we're impacting the areas that God has placed us. And listen, actually in a couple of weeks, we're going to be having an outdoor service in Fuquay. And so if you call Fuquay Verena home, we are going to be looking forward to seeing you there. Now, we've been in this series called Made for More, and this series has really been focusing on the fact that God has called us to more than we could ever think of. He's called us to more than the things that we're actually trying to achieve in life. Now, whether you're new to hope, whether you're new in your faith, or you've been here for a long time, uh, something that's happening that we're kicking back into gear is called our growth track. And our growth track is comprised of four classes that we're teaching, and the first one is all about exploring your faith and asking questions. The second class is about Hope Community Church, right? What we're about and how you can get involved. Now, classes three and four is our growth class and then our go class. In our growth classes, our growth class, I can't even talk, our growth class. Our growth class is all about helping you grow in your relationship with Jesus. And then our go class is about really equipping you and sending you out to be the church where God has placed you, where you live, where you learn, where you work and you play. And something you're gonna be hearing around hope a lot in the future and even right now is that we're going after 100,000 men, women, and students, and we want to equip them to think and live biblically. And y'all, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do it through Growth Track. And that's really what this series, Being Made for More, is all about. Now, these Growth Track classes are actually, a lot of them are, are available right now on demand online. So make sure that you go and you get signed up. And also, too, we have our Made for More table groups that are in full swing right now. And so listen, if you're not a part of a small group, we want to let you know it's not too late. So get hooked up, get plugged in, ask those questions, and let's grow together. Now, it's time to get into some worship. We've got a great message that Chase Garner is going to be teaching. And so let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our minds for what God wants to do. We're so glad you're here. Let's worship together.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for that time of worship where we get to respond to you. I, I love that line that says there's, there's a million reasons to trust you. That no matter what it is we're going through, that we know that you're by our side. And so, Father, as we open up our hearts and as we open up our minds to receive what it is that you want to say to your church today, we pray that we would be reminded that we have been made for more. And God, we know that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what you've prepared for those that love you. And so our eyes are on you. We're focused on you. We ask that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's not about building. Our kingdom. We are made for more. We're not just an ordinary bank. We're really here to to help others, whether it be you know buying their first home, helping with a mortgage. I've been working um, in banking the last 15 to 16 years. I graduated from college, um, got my first job. Uh, my parents always instilled in me that you finish school, you get a good job, you climb the corporate ladder, you make money. That's what you do. That's what's important. So that's all I knew, um, and that's what I did. And about Five to six years ago, I started feeling this unrest. I wasn't sure what was happening, why I was feeling that way. Um, I did a little bit of job hopping in between. I kept thinking that it, this job will be it. This will make me feel better, and it didn't. COVID hit, I was able to work from home full time. I thought, this is perfect. This is going to be the best job ever. I had a great boss, I was making good money. I didn't even have to get out of my pajamas. It was just, ideal. Fast forward to March of 2021, my dad died uh, abruptly and that just really changed my whole world. I was definitely shaken to my core. I, I was angry with God, but I still tried to cling close to him and I knew he was going to get me through it. I did keep working because I didn't, I didn't know anything else. So um, I just kept pushing through. Um, and God kept nudging me. I remember working from home and I looked out my window one day and I just thought, what am I doing with my life? I'm not helping anybody. This is so meaningless. And I talked to my husband I said, I feel like God wants me to quit my job. And I thought he would be shocked and, and would, would tell me I'm nuts and we can't do that. This doesn't make sense financially. We, we need to we need both incomes. Um, but he didn't, he didn't say any of that. He uh, was fully supportive. He said, if you feel like that's where God is calling you to quit, then I support you. Um, and that, that was huge. So I quit and I didn't have any prospects uh, job wise. And um, an opportunity at Hope came up three months later. And it, it was not in a finance role. It was a, a campus admin role, which I hadn't done before, but I felt encouraged immediately when I walked through the door and knew, I just had this sense of peace and knew this is where I was supposed to be. And I've recently been uh, given the opportunity uh, to work in the finance realm at Hope. So now, um, it, it's kind of funny, but now I'm working full time again recently um, back in finance. So uh, it, it's been a whirlwind, but God has provided the whole time. It's, it's a piece that's really come with just listening to what God had in store for me. Yeah. Well, what's up, Hope? How are we? You doing good? Now, I stand up here like 25, 30 times a year, and I start off with that same question, how are we? And no one ever responds, I'm good. How are you, Chase? No one asks me how I am. How are you, 
I'm good. Thanks for asking. I'm okay. I've kind of been dealing with this weird, like, emotional, mental sort of deal that I couldn't figure out. Kind of been acting uncharacteristic for me. Uh, I've been uh, kind of down. Um, I've been finding myself getting super distracted, like really distracted, especially when I'm driving, which is not a good time to get distracted. I've uh, been spending time on weird websites like Kelly Blue Book and uh, CarMax and stuff. And I looked in the back seat of my truck um, this week and there's a stack of auto traders. I don't even know how to get there. I think when I get gas, I'm just compelled to go grab one. And so just kind of weird stuff. So I asked some godly men to kind of come around and try to diagnose me like what's going on in my heart. And so after some conversations, they have formally diagnosed me and the technical term is TE, which stands for truck envy truck envy. And what's been going on is that three of my good friends in the past year have recently come into possession of some brand new fancy trucks. And uh, they're beautiful. Uh, one of them got a Chevy Silverado and it's black. It's got chrome on it. It's got beautiful wheels. Another one got a, a Chevy Trail Boss and it's blacked out again with the awesome wheels. And uh, these are like American made manly beauties of trucks, right? One of my friends got this same truck that I have already, but it's newer and it's better. It's got a three inch lift. It's got fancy tires, an off-road kit. And I may or may not, when I hang out with them, walk around their trucks a few times and kind of peek in and just imagine myself driving up to my daughter's soccer practice in one of those bad boys and all the other dads just kind of like drooling. It's truck envy. And I got a bad case of it. And the crazy thing is I already have a truck. It's not new, but it's nice. I'm not going to need another truck for like 10 years. It doesn't have any off-road stuff. It's just, stock, it's just stock, but it's, it's, a, it's an amazing truck and I'm lucky to have it. God somehow saw fit to miraculously send his spirit into the heart of my wife to allow me to have that truck. And I'm not going to need another one for 10 years. I don't even technically need a truck. Like I type on a computer and go to meetings all week. I'm not loading four by fours and barbed wire in the back to take care of my cattle ranch. Like I'm in Target pickup. That's where the LaCroix and almond milk goes, right? But I don't need one. But still, I, I want one. It doesn't stop me from dreaming about it and imagining myself having one. Anyone in here like me? No, I'm alone. Okay, there's some more. Yeah. And as I've been contemplating this kind of automotive infatuation, I've realized that it's not just my truck that I'm dissatisfied with. It's other things. You know what, you know what it is? It's everything from uh, my house to gadgets, to my clothes, to golf clubs. Once I get something in my possession, whatever it is, it just seems to lose its allure. Like the shiny factor, the new factor just wears away so quickly and no more than a few months have to go by before I want something different and I want something new and I want something better. One of the biggest struggles of my life is this feeling of unsatisfaction with what I currently have. And I'm learning that it's not just trucks and it's not just, just other things, but it's also not just me. I'm realizing this is one of the biggest problems of our day. This inability we all have to be satisfied with what we currently have with our life as we currently um, experience it. Have you noticed this? Like when it's spring, we can't wait for it to become summer. And once it gets hot, we're like, we can't wait for fall. Or we can't, when we're at home and we're alone and we're lonely, we can't wait to hang out with other people. And then we go to a get together and an hour in, we're like, God, I can't wait to get rid of these people and go back to being alone, right? We plan this trip for Disney World with our kids and we can't wait to go on that. But then like two days with 100% humidity and 12 bucks for a bottle of water. And we're like, I can't wait to go back home, right? It's the story of our lives. I, when we're in school, we can't wait to get to college. Then we get to college, we can't wait to get a job. Then we get a job and we're like, this kind of stinks. So we, we dream about the next job and the next vacation and the next season of life and on and on until we hit retirement. And we've never once been satisfied. We've never once been happy with what we presently have. There's actually a study put out a few years ago by The Economist that proves this. For decades, economists all over the world just assumed that the more money you had, the more happier you would be. Uh, but tons and tons of surveys and studies have come out that actually have proven there is no connection between the amount of money you have and your personal well-being. More money, more possessions, more stuff does not equal more happiness or more fulfillment. And so some economists have begun to just measure happiness and well-being itself. 
uh, kind of disconnected from money and finances. And what they found is what they call the U-bend. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's called the U-bend of life. And what they found is that most people are relatively happy up until they're about 18 years old. And then <laughs> you can see the chart. It's a nosedive into just deep and, and uh, a turn, not a turn, all encompassing sadness until you reach rock bottom and your mid 50s, also known as the midlife crisis. And then for some reason, you slowly begin to claw out of that pit of despair until you actually reach the peak, the zenith, the happiest years of your life from 75 until you go to be with Jesus. So if you're like a student here and you got big dreams for the next few years, I'm sorry, I just crushed those. But um, the crazy thing is it's not just in America. Um, this applies to people from every nationality, every socioeconomic group, every race, every ethnicity, the U-bend occurs the world over. So listen, the dissatisfaction that I feel, the dissatisfaction that you feel, it is a real statistically measurable thing. It's part of the world that you and I live in. But it's how we respond to the U-bend that gets us into trouble. See, most of us, when we start feeling that despair, we start feeling that dissatisfaction, the first thing we'll try to do is change our external circumstances, right? We think I'm unhappy. It must be because of the house that I currently have. Or I'm kind of down, so it must be the car or the phone that I have. I'm feeling kind of sad, so it must be the job that I have or the town that I live in or the boat that I do not yet own. And so early in life, we get into circumstance management mode where we move over and over and over again and we change jobs constantly and we spend tons of money on all these material possessions. And the end result is we have no geographical sense of place. We don't really know where home is because we've moved so much. Uh, we, we lose deep connections relationally because once we get a group of friends, we move on to the next and we end up with an awe-inspiring amount of debt. See, in seeking to get rid of that dissatisfaction, we just end up more unhappy than when we begin. And it's ironic if you think about it. Our desire for an abundance of stuff keeps us from having an abundant life, the one that Jesus tells us we were made for. But see, studies like the you've been just tell us what the Bible has been telling us over and over and over again. Material possessions, stuff, money, it has no correlation with well-being. In fact, one of the last paragraphs, uh, paragraphs in this article says this, perhaps the you bend is merely an expression of the effect of external circumstances. After all, common factors affect people at different stages of the life cycle. People in their 40s, for instance, often have teenage children. Could the misery of the middle age be the consequence of sharing space with angry adolescents? I feel what he's saying there. I didn't write this though. And older people tend to be richer. So could their relative contentment be the result of their piles of cash? The answer, it turns out, is no. If you control for cash, employment status and children, the U-bend is still there. Then the author writes this. So the growing happiness that, fol that follows middle-aged misery must be the result, not of external circumstances, but internal change. The author is a prophet. He doesn't even know it, right? Satisfaction is not the product of external circumstances, but internal change. Here's what I want you to hear today. You can escape the U-bend. You can actually experience deep and abiding satisfaction in any circumstance and at any age, but it has nothing to do with what's going on out here. It has nothing to do with what's going on in your bank account or your possessions, and that has everything to do with what's going on in your heart. And I know that it's possible because we come face to face with dozens of people that have that deep and abiding sense of joy and satisfaction, even when their circumstances are crazy. We see them in the Bible. And I want to introduce you to one of them named Paul in the book of Philippians. In fact, if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there to Philippians chapter four. Most of you know Paul. Some of you may not. He wrote half the New Testament. Uh, but you may not know uh, that Paul actually grew up in a very wealthy and privileged home. 
His parents were super well-educated. Um, Paul was well-educated. He kind of went to the Ivy League of his day. And so early on in life, he had esteem, he had respect, he had material goods. Uh, but then all of that changed when he found Jesus, or I should say Jesus found him. And he became kind of a traveling itinerant evangelist of sorts. So he would go uh, from town to town and just share the gospel and spread the word of Jesus wherever he could. And because of that, he went from prosperity uh, to poverty. He was basically dependent on the gifts of those that he talked to Jesus about and led to the Lord. And not only that, but every single town he went in, there were Jewish leaders there that hated him that persecuted him. In fact, when he writes this letter to the church that meets in Philippi, he is in jail and he's awaiting execution. In fact, he says earlier in this book, I don't know if I'm gonna make it out alive. He did not know if he was gonna be executed or not. And so he's gone, not from rags to riches, but from riches to rags, from wealth and comfort to poverty and really fearing for his life. And those sort of outside circumstances, they should make a person feel things like anger or fear or despair or sadness or stress. But that's not what Paul's feeling at all. Look at what he writes. This is shocking. They had recently sent him some money now that he's in prison. And he said, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need for... I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. And I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. Did you hear that? Paul says, I've done it. I finally figured it out. I have learned the secret of being content content with a little or content with a lot. And again, he's speaking from experience. Paul's not like writing a letter saying, I think I'd be okay if we downsize a little bit. No, he's in jail about to die. And he says, even, even now I'm fine because I've learned how to be content. And that's encouraging because you know what that means? It means Paul didn't always know how to be content. And if he learned it, then that's something that we can learn as well. In fact, it's an incredibly important skill to learn. In fact, uh, Paul kind of becomes obsessed with this contentment idea um, in the last years of his life. He kind of dwells on this idea of contentment and unpacks it in other texts. He's actually released from prison um, in this case. He doesn't die. And he has a few good years of ministry before he's imprisoned again. And ultimately he is executed under Nero. Uh, but right after he's let out of prison, he writes just some really good wisdom um, letters to all these pastors that he's appointed, one of them being Timothy. And look at what he says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He says, he's talking about all these wealthy people that are just chasing after all this wealth. And he says, they don't know. True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. He says, Timothy, you got to know, you got to learn what I've learned. Contentment is better than anything that money can buy. And as he begins, uh, continues to write, you can see that Paul kind of uh, says, now that I know this secret, I can't believe that I lived any other way. I can't believe how dumb I used to be. He says, after all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take anything with us when we leave. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. He says, now that I know the secret, I look around at all these people and I'm asking myself, why in the world are people putting all this time and energy and effort and spending all this money and going into debt for these silly possessions that first off can never satisfy them. And second, they can't even take with them. Their bonehead son's gonna get whatever they have left over, right? They can't take it with them. And not only is it dumb, but Paul says it's also dangerous. He says this, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation. Now notice he didn't say rich people. There's nothing morally wrong with having money. In the Bible, money is pointed to as a blessing. It's a good thing. Being wealthy is a blessing. God chooses how much each one of us get. We might want to contest that, but it's his choice. Uh, but it's not bad to have a lot. What's wrong is to have your heart affection set on it, to love that wealth more than God. And Paul says people who, who have that, who long to be rich, they fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves 
with many sorrows. He's saying the love of money, the longing for material possessions, it's dangerous. It can lead to so much more than just going into debt or just frustration. It can actually lead to sin and to a long list of it. Jesus talks about this as well. In Luke 12, he says, beware, guard yourself against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. All throughout the Bible, when it comes to this, this reaching out for material possessions, the authors say, watch out. It's a trap, be on your guard, it's dangerous because it can lead to what? It can lead to um, borrowing more money than is wise to do. Once you get a lot of money, they let you borrow even more, right? It can lead to working 50, 60, 80 hours a week at the expense of your family. It can lead to uh, argument after argument with your spouse. How many of you have ever fought over money with your spouse? Yeah, it's like the number one argument causing thing. It can lead to compromising your values and integrity just to get that next thing. It can lead to stress, it can lead to theft, it can lead to crime. It can be one of the most powerful tools that Satan uses to hold you back from the abundant life that God has for you. You were made for more than that type of life. That's what Jesus is saying. It's a trick, it's a trap. The wisest man and the richest man to ever live, Solomon, he said this, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. So what good is wealth, except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? All throughout the Bible, we learn that, that if you ever wanna be content, we have to get it through our thick skulls, that abundant stuff doesn't lead to the abundant life. Well, what does? What does? How do we break out of the U-bend? What, what, what's the Christian secret that Paul has learned? Well, he tells us back in Philippians chapter four, remember he says this, he says, um, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty with plenty or little for, or this is the reason, this is the secret, this is what's unlocked it for me for I've learned I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Yeah, you quoted it. It's the most, one of the most known verses and one of the most misquoted verses, right? Notice what Paul's not saying. He's not saying that Jesus will give me the strength to finish that 5K I signed up for and never trained for, right? He's not talking about accomplishing anything. He's not talking about achieving anything. The context is contentment. He's saying that no matter what your outside circumstances are, whether they're good or bad, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant, whether they're dire or sufficient, no matter what's going on around you, Paul's learned that Jesus will meet those deep needs, those deep hungers that you have in a way that only he can. That's the secret. I think maybe a better translation in context would be I can endure all things through Christ who satisfies me. That's what Paul's really getting at. So the answer to breaking the you bin, the secret to contentment, I mean, it's the Sunday school answer, is Jesus, right? Now, if you're new to this whole church thing, that's a weird sentence, okay? <laughs> How can you be content? Jesus, right? Jesus is better than a new car. Jesus is my vacation home, right? Jesus is that new pair of clothes. Like that's a weird sentence. And if you don't think it's weird, you've been hanging around church folk too much. It's weird, okay? So, but how does this really work? Well, hang with me, hang with me. Whenever you feel that compulsion, that desire to, to chase after that material possession, or I just gotta buy that thing. Have you ever stopped and paused and just asked yourself, why? Why do I want that thing? Sometimes your spouse will ask you and you'll just say, just because I do, because I want it, right? But have you ever asked, what's, what's the root cause? That's a powerful question to ask. Like when it comes to my truck, I've been asking myself, that's, I really do have truck envy. That's not just an illustration. I've asked myself, why do I want a new truck so bad? Part of the reason is, is just for comfort. It's just for comfort. I got three kids and a wife and it's uncomfortable with three kids in the back seat. So it'd be more comfortable at a bigger truck and we could fit the three kids. We wouldn't have to put the toddler in the bed so much. I'm just kidding. I don't do that, right? But it's just, it's just for comfort. But then you read in 2 Corinthians 1, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all what? Of comfort. I'm hoping that truck will give me that something only God really can at a heart level. Sometimes it's for rest, 
right? We say, if I just had a vacation home, man, then I'd be able to get the rest that I need. First off, no, you wouldn't, because you'd have so many construction projects. I was at an airport in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I remember going to see some friends in college, and there was a very wealthy man and uh, a father and son, and he asked the father and son what they were going to do, and he said, we're taking a week-long fishing trip. It's our dream fishing trip. We've been planning it forever. And the wealthy guy, he kind of teared up, and he said, I got three grandsons, and they would love nothing more then they go fishing with me, but we just bought our second vacation house. We're putting a porch on it, and I have to give up my vacation and go oversee that project, right? It's actually sad because of it. And you know, you don't come back from vacation rested, do you? <laughs> you come up more tired than you began because real rest, it comes from God. Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens for I will give you rest, right? Or sometimes we want that something as a status symbol. I want that car or that suit or that house so people know how important I am, so people know how special I am. Listen, if you're a Christ follower, you are the blood-bought son or daughter of the king of the universe. How much more special can it get? Or sometimes Jenny and I will just lay in bed and kind of plan these vacations we'll never take. You ever do that? And a lot of that's just kind of escaping the drudgery of life, like adding some adventure to what can be kind of a boring existence. But then... You go to God's word and you realize, oh, as Christ follows, you're, you're the hands and feet of Jesus sent into a broken and hurting world to shine his light. Like you've been invited into the greatest adventure of all time, God making all things new. That's what you need to press into, see? See, that's how Jesus meets those needs. All of those desires that you're trying to fulfill through more or through newer or through better Ultimately, only Jesus can fulfill. That's why I love that video of Lauren, right? She had a lot and she didn't have peace. So she chose to have a little less and she finally felt that peace. And now she works at Hope. So she's got a lot less because I know what we pay our people and she still has purpose, right? And she feels peace. And it's when you begin to press into Jesus instead of stuff, that's where you begin to unlock the secret of contentment. And can I just be real honest for you for a second? Like as Christ followers, you know what we believe about this world? It's broke. It's broken. And it will always be broken. Not just the humans that are in it, like you and me, but the world itself. Paul says it's a frustrated world. It actually groans, like painful groaning. It's not the world God originally intended, and it's never going to be. And nothing you can ever do can ever make it like it once was. No amount of changing your outside circumstances can change the amount of joy and satisfaction you can get out of this world. One day, it's going to be destroyed. And a new one's going to be put in its place. And one day, it will have the ability to fulfill us to the measure that God intended. But until then, listen, we're just taking a few laps around the sun. And a hand-me-down, used, broken-down, beater, lemon... AC don't work, no radio, got three flat tires, got an oil leak, it's going to break down eventually. You know what that means? Lower your expectations. Like in this body, in this world, you're not going to jump from a cloud of joy to a cloud of satisfaction to just unending joy. That's not going to happen in this world. One day it will be yours, but not until God comes back and makes things new. In this world, you're always going to feel a certain level of dissatisfaction, of holy discontent. And that's okay. You can't fix that. But when that feeling arises that I got to fix it and it's going to be through this or it's going to be through that, we've got to learn to stop reaching out and grasping for things that will never and can never satisfy, right? Reaching out for a broken thing out of a broken world to try to fix a broken heart. That's something only Jesus can do. And we have to learn to press into Jesus to press into all that he has for us. And then just to be patient. I know people that are content. And there's three words. There's three words that separate a person that's found that secret of contentment from someone that hasn't. You know what those three words are? I can wait. I can wait. Do I want that thing? Yeah. Really, really badly sometimes but knowing that I have all eternity to experience all the joy that I could shake a stick at 
and uh, knowing that the life, this life that I live is relatively short and there's some really important, eternally important things that God wants me to be a part of. In view of all of that, do I really want it? Yeah, but I can wait. I can wait. Those are words that can change your life. They can lead you away from this, this, this constant driving for more stuff and into more of the life that God has for you. So I've gone on a little bit too long, but this whole contentment thing that we've been talking about, it's a skill. It's an ability that we can learn. It's something that we can progress in. But for those of you just starting out, I wanna give you three steps, three kind of baby steps that will lead you into this contentment that Paul's talking about. Here's the first thing I'd encourage all of you to do. First thing is to track your money. Track the money that comes in and track the money that goes out. This is like a contentment gauge, you see? Because reaching out to material possessions, it's so natural, it's so instinctive that you might be doing it all the time and not even realize that you're doing it. See, what happens when you write down what's going on in your finances that actually reveals what's really going on in your heart. Like you may go into this exercise thinking, I'm really content, I don't struggle, I don't try to medicate with all this stuff, I'm a content, generous person. And then you look at the results and you're like, oh, I'm a discontent Starbucks addict that's trying to medicate with 32 subscription streaming devices, right? Who knew, right? And that's okay, it's gonna reveal what's in your heart, but that's the first step, track all of it. Second, I'd encourage you to make an I can wait list. Make a list of all the things in view of eternity and Jesus and all that he is for you. What are some things that you really want in the moment, but you can wait on because of what Christ is for you? Maybe you can wait for a year and see if you still want it. Maybe you wait five years. Maybe this is something I don't need in this life. I really like a swimming pool. Jesus knows that. He's building my house in heaven. He's probably got a great pool for me. I can put it off for the next 80 years, right? But make a list of the things that you know you don't need that you can live without because of Jesus. And here's the third one. Take a step towards generosity. And you're thinking, there it is. I knew he was gonna get there. He was working up to this. Pastor wants my money, right? This is a bait and switch. No, 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 no. I'll say what I always say. I'm more concerned with you experiencing true contentment than I am with you giving to Hope Community Church. So if you're here and we haven't earned your trust or you, you, don't, you don't feel good about giving financial resources to us, that's okay, give somewhere else, okay? Uh, that's completely fine. Hopefully we get to a place where we earn your trust or if like nothing we're doing excites you, might not be the right place for you, right? Maybe you just need to ask some more questions to really see what's going on. But I want you to take a step towards generosity because unlike spending your resources on a material possession, giving it away actually does bring joy. It actually does bring peace and contentment. When you do this, you'll actually figure it out and you need to experience it before you believe it. You'll actually learn to believe what Jesus said, it is better to give than receive. Generosity just kind of stokes that fire of your contentment in Jesus. So I don't know what that step is for. If you've never been generous with your resources, just give one time. Or if you've given once, maybe your step is to become a regular giver. Or maybe if you give regularly, maybe it's to up the percentage from 1% to 5% or up to 10% or up to 11%. Maybe if that's you already, God's kind of laying on your heart, man, I want you to give a big end of your gift. Whatever it is, take that step. And I promise you, I promise you what Jesus says is true. Now, if all this sounds like something you really want to do or something you really need to do because your finances are a wreck and you need some help, but you don't know where to get started, did you know that we have a stewardship ministry? We do. And it's for this very reason. We call it a ministry because it is. Uh, it's here to help you find freedom and to help you find contentment with your current circumstances. So if you don't know where to go, just go to gethope.net slash stewardship. On that page, you'll find like documents for tracking your spending, for planning your spending. You'll find apps that you can help you kind of control your spending. But even better than all of that is we actually have financial coaches. We have people that will sit down with you and work with you through a process and they'll help you get started on the right track. Me and Jenny, my wife and I, we both took financial coaching 10 years ago and it changed our life. It changed our life. We found freedom, we found peace. So if that's you, just go to the stewardship page and find the resources you need. But listen, when it comes to this whole contentment thing, ultimately the choice is up to you. 
Don't let the abundance of stuff keep you from the abundant life. Right? Break out of that you've been. Step into the secret of contentment. And I think you'll be surprised what God can do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Man, thank you for these people. Um, so much kingdom potential in this room and at all of our campuses and those watching online. So Father, this was a convicting talk even for me. <laughs> but would you teach us to run to you, not to stuff? Would you prove that you, you can satisfy? And would you lead us into the secret of contentment so that we can be freed up from the chase of stuff to chasing after your kingdom, which is what we're gonna talk about next week. So we pray all these things for your name and for your glory. Amen. Thanks so much, Chase, for that message. You know, today is the first Sunday of the month. And you know what that means here at Hope. It means communion. And so before we get into communion, I just wanna make you aware of a couple of things. You know, uh, if you call Hope Community Church your home, and you listen to that message about contentment and you're looking to take that next step in practicing contentment, you know, one of the best ways we can do that is through our generosity. Listen, our church, Hope Community Church, is touching lives all around the triangle, meeting the needs of the people in our community. And none of that happens without your generosity. And so if you're looking for a way really to uh, grow your relationship with God, generosity and giving is one of the best ways. And we have all kinds of ways that you can give here to Hope Community Church and, and, and get involved in what God is doing here. Listen, the Bible says that it's better to give than to receive. In fact, it says, give and it will come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Now, what does all that mean? Here's what it means, basically, is that when you give to God, he's going to give back to you, but you always get back more than what you gave because you can't outgive God. And so we want to encourage you to sow into what God is doing here at Hope Community Church. Now, you may be saying, hey, I don't know if I'm ready to give to this church. Listen, all we want to do is encourage you to be a giver. Find some place that you uh, feel compelled to bless with your finances and God is going to bless you for your faith in giving to that mission. Now, listen, there might be some of you who are listening to all this and you're saying, listen, I'd love to give, but I've got some financial issues. Well, listen, we have some financial resources here just for you. Maybe you need help putting together a budget. Maybe you've uh, found yourself in a bunch of debt. We have some resources available for you. So if you go to our website, you'll find out more information there to help you out. Now, as I said in the beginning of this, I said that it's communion time. And so, you know, even if you're not here personally at one of our campuses, you can still have communion at home. Go get some bread, go get some juice. It's not about necessarily, do you have the right bread or do you have the right wine or this or that? What it's about is remembering that Jesus gave his life so that we could have life through him. And so this is the time where we remember all that Jesus did for us when he put his life, his body on that cross and bled for us and died for us and Jesus rose him back again. And so this is that time. So we want to encourage you to do that now. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time right here at Hope. God bless.